Hi, David. Hello, Monique. Great to see you. Nice to see you too. Thank you for joining me today for Greater Portland Inc.'s inaugural video series, Groundbreakers, Leaders of the New Economy. Awesome. You're Happy the, to be here. Thank you. You're the co-founder and executive chairman of Jump Crew, an outsourced sales and marketing partner. What I find to be most astonishing is in the less in less than five years, Jump Crew has grown from two people to 400, generating $250 million in new revenue for its clients. This year, Jump Crew was voted one of Nashville's best and brightest companies to work for. You've worked with some of the largest names in the business. You've driven $35 million in revenue for a major social media platform in 2021. You've helped 25 companies take new products to market last year. You've onboarded 700 salespeople and all of this during a pandemic. You're a self-described slacker to CEO, which is quite hard to believe. So please share with Greater Portland your career journey, your current role, and more about Jump Crew. No, it's very, thank you so much, Monique. That was, uh, it was really kind and it's really humbling to hear you sum up five or six years of work in uh, or 20 or 30 seconds because it sounded like a lightning strike, um, but it doesn't feel that way when you're in it every day. Uh, whether you're just starting out your career or you're the executive chairman of a rapidly growing company, when you're in the fight, um, you're fighting every day and you're, you're putting a lot of your own effort and energy into getting to the next level. And it took me a long time to figure that out. My journey looked a lot like a lot of folks starting out their careers. I, I didn't have a lot of focus or direction. I had enough confidence, but didn't have the experience to know how to use it, right? So I started my career in Los Angeles, working in film and TV. And um, after spending a couple of years making one feature film, I found myself at, at 28 years old, looking at entry-level jobs again, and it was a shock. Uh, for me, it was a decision to go into a field where my own results would determine my outcome and success. So I, I moved from what I call one of the most glamorous businesses at the time, media, entertainment, film, and television, into the uh, staffing business, into an entry-level sales role, which is generally not considered all that sexy. But the, the irony is what I discovered in going into an individual contributor role was that uh, success was a team sport and that I was, I was good at building teams. So uh, I initially had some success and ran sales teams, and then I ran operations teams, and then small companies, and then larger companies. Uh, currently, I'm managing. Uh, I'm the managing member of the board of four different companies that I co-founded or acquired. Uh, Jump Crew being one of the predominant larger ones, and certainly uh, one of the larger employers at this point uh, in my portfolio, and the biggest one in my portfolio in Nashville. Uh, I'm the executive chairman there, and that has meant a lot of different things over the last five years. Mostly, I am at Jump Crew to support the CEO, and uh, he's a great guy. His name's Robert Henderson. He was a first-time CEO. So as he was putting his team together, I filled a bunch of different roles for him along the way. But currently, there, there is a chief people officer who's doing a great job. There's a great chief operating officer, and there's a CFO. Those are all roles that as we were growing from two to five to 10, I was able to make a contribution just based on my experience and sharing my experience and rolling up my sleeves when, when I needed to. So when you look back at your life, when you look back over your career, was there a turning point, something that made you reevaluate and get to where you are now, which is a tremendous entrepreneur? You know, it's funny. I moved to Los Angeles when I was 22 years old, determined uh, not to let money be the primary motivating factor in my career. My friends were going into finance. They were going to, to business school. They knew exactly where they were going. Um, and then uh, when I was 28 and I saw my, my, my family, my, my parents in a position where they really needed some financial support for the first time and I wasn't in a position to give it or could see that I would in the near term future. It really changed me and focused me on uh, staying in one role long enough to be successful at it. And that was a real turning point for me. And so when I, when I made that move from the entertainment business into sales as a career, I did it with uh, a level of focus and discipline where I knew I would sit in the seat long enough to be successful at that point in my life. That's interesting that you should say that. So I'm going to go off script a little. Sure. Now you hear about the great resignation. Yeah. We're jumping, they're moving around. We're also hearing the new term, the great regret. 
it's a different time than when you were 28 years old. Any thoughts on people taking advantages of new opportunities, hybrid, remote, and jumping around and maybe not being in a stable position as they think about their career and longevity? You know, I think it's really interesting that you mentioned regret. I just finished a great book that Dan Pink wrote. Uh, Dan Pink wrote To Sell This Human, which is one of my favorite books. And he wrote this book on how we view regret. Um, and he talks about how your life isn't defined by something that happened in the past or has not yet happened. And, uh, you know, he goes into treating yourself with compassion versus contempt, all themes that I love. Uh, I love to touch on when, I, when I'm doing my own coaching. Uh, and he also talks about how our early in life regrets are, um, are reflexive actions that we took okay. that we feel bad for. But our later in life regrets are about things that we didn't do. Right. And, uh, so when I think about regret earlier in my career, I think about uh, not sticking around long enough to gain trust and confidence to level up. And that to me was the saddest part of seeing what was happening in the great resignation because so many folks that come through even the jump crew system uh, just haven't had the patience to get the trust, to level up, to feel the success, which I believe is super contagious and, and creates a level of virality that can bring you to the next, next spot in your career. Right. So you've documented, documented pandemic lessons learned in your book, Remote yep. Leadership, How to Accelerate Achievement and Create a Community in the Work from Home World. Yep. Can you talk about companies that are embracing hybrid and the remote workplaces in the future and going forward about key management techniques in this environment? Sure. I think it's really interesting. So uh, I was able to write my book when Jump Crew went from 100% in office to 100% remote. But clearly what we're seeing is a lot of hybrid today, particularly optimizing around the type of work experience people want. Right. Uh, what's, and we are hiring in Nashville at a really, really rapid pace right now, just because managing remote teams is really hard. And we happen to be in a town where we can do that and we can hire great talent in Nashville. What, uh, what's vital today is, is just, it's more than grit and hard work. And it's also more than your intelligence and your aptitude. If you're leading successfully, you are connecting with people. You know, you're learning to share experiences, to ask questions versus give the answers. And it's a new style of leadership that was working before the pandemic, but remote work really put the spotlight on the new style right? and how important it was and how much better received that style of leadership is by folks coming into the workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. So Jump Crew has had rapid growth. Yeah. You said, hey, we're hiring like wildflowers and wildflowers in Nashville. Why did you choose Nashville for Jump Crew's headquarters? Sure. Uh, it was actually a fairly easy choice for us. Okay. We, had a, we had a short list um, because my partner and I are both from New York. It was, it was pretty East Coast centric. We didn't want to go too far. Um, and I had partners from a business years ago who were in Nashville and I had stayed in contact with them and we had co-invested in a bunch of businesses. And when I spoke to them about founding Jump Crew, Rob was on his way, my partner was on his way to Charlotte. And they, uh, they said, hey, we like Charlotte. We have friends in Charlotte, but we think, you know, you should probably have them come through Nashville on his trip. And we actually ended up triangulating the trip and sending them to Nashville. And it's really, really great to go to a town where you have people that are going to look out for you. Um, so um, they really helped us with our office space and they really helped us with uh, getting to know the folks in town that matter for us from a uh, city municipality level, from a Tennessee state level, and from a, a TVA level to get the support that we were looking for because we knew we were going to be hiring a lot of people really, really quickly. Uh, and it made all the difference. It was really, really great. So Nashville itself compared uh, really, really well relative to the demographic and the folks who are moving there every day and the expansion of the city, the excitement of the city. But I think it was really the, the people we were partnering with that made the ultimate difference for us. And it's turned out to be a great choice for a, a lot of different reasons for us. That's great. And I think it's so important for our economic development professionals in Portland to hear you say that, that collaboration with the local level, as well as the state level and the private sector to create an atmosphere where companies feel welcome and the business, business climate is friendly, I think is, is really key. 
being able to talk to the local officials on the phone, yep. meet with them, show up in the meetings, present our plan, and and for them to recognize that we had to make a fairly quick decision and their willingness to work with us was a big deal in our decision. Okay. I'm curious how long was the runway in making a decision? It was uh, a couple of months. It was like probably a, a 90 day process that we were running at that point. Very nice. So you've had rapid growth. How have you found, how did you find rather success in a pandemic? <laughs> that, uh, that was a really, really difficult period of, uh, of business, right? You, can, so, you can't tell, right? You can't tell with, with you know, When I think about it, there's, there's a level of management trauma that sets in. We had to make really, really hard decisions initially on how to limit our losses. We were an early stage company that was not cash flow positive. So we're dealing with a very limited pot of, of resources that we could work with. And then we worked really, really hard to keep the core together. Okay. Um, and, and I think the efforts that we made in, in gaining the trust of the folks on the team and in building the community, particularly as we were rebuilding in a remote work environment and couldn't have people together getting to know each other, I think that made all the difference. Our product has always been really solid. You know, we are great at lead gen and, and selling of B2B products, whether it's technology or a product or service or advertising. Um, the, the difference in the culture, in our ability to work remotely seamlessly, really, really led to another rapid growth phase for us that seemed kind of seamless once it started to kick in. That's great. So what's next for you and Jump Crew? <laughs> uh, on a personal level, I'm working hard to get this message out about how to grow your work community to accelerate achievement. Doing that lets me get deeper into the coaching work that I love and the community building that I'm passionate about. I'm doing a lot of that in Nashville right now. At Jump Crew, we're, uh, we'll probably end up hiring another 100 people in the next 90 days. We've done that wow. a couple of times. Wow. Uh, we're, we're ready for it and we're really okay. excited about it. Um, you know, the, uh, our, our clients' needs are expanding and that leads to our growth. Uh, we're also investing in growing our own local business marketing platform that we call AdPost. We have 5,000 local advertising clients who are currently buying digital ads on a website that uh, is called My Base Guide, which is the official online base guide for about 75% of US military bases. And it's super excited. We're rolling out a local marketing platform uh, and we'll partner with other, other local publishers to give local businesses better control over their ability to drive leads and their ad spend. I'm excited about that. That sounds, that's a lot. And <laughs> that sounds amazing. No, you, you really are a disruptor, no doubt. So who are other disruptors that you admire and why? You know, it's, it's funny you're asking this question today. I was on the phone with a friend last night who lives in Portland, and he was telling me the story of a local business he's fascinated with in Portland. It's, oh. a, it's a coffee shop called Ardent Coffee that okay. was founded fairly recently last year or two by uh, uh, two folks, uh, Isaac Holm and Joe Smith. And it's a donation-based coffee shop run by volunteers where 100% of the profit goes to ending world slavery. And I just love it. When I think about disruption, I think about that. I think about how folks on a local level can actually make an impactful difference. Um, on, a, on a larger level, you know, uh, like I, I love the, the stuff that Jay Shetty talks about on his podcast. I love listening to Eric Schmidt, the Google founder, talk about AI. Uh, and I love, you know, guys like Dan Pink who are really leaning into the aspects of, uh, of management uh, around the people experience that uh, that a lot of people avoided for a long time. Mm -hmm. That's funny that here you are in Nashville telling me about a coffee shop <laughs> in Portland. And not only telling me about a coffee shop in Portland, but Portland being the foodie capital, <laughs> right, of the U.S. We're ranked number one for the nation's top foodie city. Nashville actually is ranked 76. So before I let you go, can you tell me What's your favorite restaurant in Nashville? Oh my God, there are so many, Monique. Okay. Um, you know, I, I hope the folks from Portland come to Nashville for the food experience as well, because it's great. I was just at one uh, a couple of months ago that I loved, a fairly new one called The Optimist. There, there are ones that have been there for a long time, for the five years that I've been there, Butcher and B and Fifth and Taylor that I love going back to again and again. The, the scene is evolving really, really quickly. So, you know, if I'm down there every four weeks, every six weeks, I could go to a new hot restaurant every time I'm down there. It's great. That's nice. Well, 
David, thank you so much for joining me today for our inaugural series. I learned so much. I hope our viewers and listeners in Greater Portland takes away, take away um, a lot from this conversation. And you are truly a remarkable leader and can't wait to jump into your book as well. Thank you so much, Monique. Really appreciate it. Thank you.